Okay, um, I'll go ahead and start. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm not Matt Rivara, um, but Matt's on vacation, so I'm covering for him today. Um, we have two speakers today. Um, I will let uh, Raj introduce our second speaker, but it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, who is Ian DeBoer, and who will be speaking on continuous glucose monitoring in chronic kidney disease. And thank you very much, Sarah. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to talk today about uh, an exciting evolution of technology and some of the work we've done here uh, in Seattle about uh, CGM and chronic kidney disease. And I'll start with a case. This is a case from the VA, my clinic. I'm presenting him as he was in 2016, a veteran who was 70 years old with longstanding type 2 diabetes and retinopathy. He had progressive proteinuric stage four chronic kidney disease um, with a graph of his uh, uh, EGFR shown on the upper right. Um, intensively treated with blood pressure medications. Um, also was on fairly high doses of insulin, glargine 76 units a day and prandial uh, aspart. And despite that his hemoglobin A1C was 9.1%. And uh, um, he was told he needed to get that lower. And whenever he, uh, he and his endocrinologist tried to ramp up the insulin, he had recurrent symptomatic hypoglycemia episodes, um, which were really troubling him. And so uh, I'll come back to this case after I uh, discuss some, some data. I'm gonna talk today about a brief background about glycemia and particularly hypoglycemia and how uh, kidney failure and kidney disease play into that. I have three poll questions uh, surveying how our division manages diabetes specifically for dialysis patients. So get ready to, to answer those. I'll talk briefly about an overview of rapidly advancing CGM technology and then talk about two studies that we've, uh, or one that we've completed here, the CANDI study, you've seen bits and pieces of data from that study already, and then plans for a new study called the, the BLOSSOM study. And I do have disclosures. The relevant ones here are that uh, I, in the studies that I'll talk about, um, equipment and supplies have been donated from the CGM companies um, that, that make them, which makes the research feasible. So I'm gonna try and, and very quickly go over background uh, using this diagram. So hypoglycemia is a common complication of diabetes, um, largely related to treatments. It's insulin and to some extent sulfonylureas that are used to control hyperglycemia that also cause hypoglycemia. And there are certainly other patient factors that enhance this, including uh, low residual pancreatic beta cell function. And if you don't have your own insulin, you need to use higher doses of medications and that causes the hypoglycemic. And there are patients who have hypoglycemia unawareness um, uh, for neuropathy and other reasons or impaired counter-regulation so that when they start to get low, they, they don't um, uh, secrete glucagon and have other responses that, that um, uh, avert that. And then um, we think that hypoglycemia can cause a number of bad outcomes. The obvious ones when in, uh, consciousness is impaired, you can have accidents, falls, and fractures. And there's a a uh, strong literature suggesting that hypoglycemia may promote um, arrhythmias uh, leading to cardiovascular events and that that may actually happen even without um, overt hypoglycemia with subclinical or, or, or mild hypoglycemia. Another problem with hypoglycemia is that it really limits diabetes therapy. So one of the reasons that patients can't get to goal, uh, like, like my patient that I presented, uh, was that you keep running into hypoglycemia and so you can't lower your overall glucose and presumably that can contribute to diabetes complications over time. So what about chronic kidney disease? What is, uh, how does this change things? Well, at least with advanced chronic kidney disease and kidney failure, we do see cachexia and wasting, um, so reduced energy stores. Um, the kidneys do make a fair amount of glucose through gluconeogenesis and um, as kidney function declines, uh, that uh, presumably decreases. And dialysis may have a number of direct effects on, on glycemia, both peritoneal and, and, and hemo. And diabetes and CKD together may be synergistic in that they um, uh, can lead to impaired drug clearance and, and drug accumulation, as well as multiple causes of neuropathy, which can promote hypoglycemia, as I noted. And finally, um, as we all know, with uh, rapid uh, red blood cell turnover, with uh, blood loss, EPO in particular, and iron deficiency, uh, we can have inaccurate hemoglobin A1c that is oftentimes biased low, which um, uh, makes it harder to ascertain hypoglycemia and, and control hyperglycemia. So I'm just going to show two data slides uh, on some of this and then, and then move on. 
um, to talk about uh, the rest of the talk. The first data slide is uh, a nice um, a population based study of hypoglycemia requiring hospital care in, in the hospital or, or ER in Ontario, Canada. Um, and they looked at rates of these severe hypoglycemic episodes by EGFR. Um, and on the left, you can see people who were using antihyperglycemic medications. And what's really quite impressive in my mind is that the, the rate of hypoglycemia is a full order of magnitude different from people with very normal kidney function to patients who have an EGFR less than 15 or newly on, on dialysis from 80 to 800 uh, per 10,000 person years. And an 800 per 10,000 person years is a pretty high rate. That's, uh, that's eight per hundred um, uh, or 8% per year. Um, so uh, really um, a clinically relevant rate in this group. In people who aren't on antihyperglycemic medications, uh, uh, the rates are much lower, of course. There's still an order of magnitude difference from about two to 55 um, for, for rates um, over um, the, the range of kidney function. And, and um, uh, this speaks to some of the, the non-treatment related risk factors for hypoglycemia in, in people with um, advanced chronic kidney disease. And then the other data slide um, I wanna show is here. These are old data that have looked at hemoglobin A1C in dialysis patients, and they're old data because we don't have a lot since these old studies to update our glycemia assessments and, and strategies in dialysis patients. And to point out here in the left uh, from Presenius patients with diabetes, uh, this is the distribution of hemoglobin A1C uh, in this group, and you can see that the majority are normal, despite that many of these people have gotten to dialysis uh, because of history of poor glycemic control. Hard to know whether this is due to uh, falsely low hemoglobin A1Cs, as I noted, or um, there is a change in, in physiology, um, uh, perhaps due to low decreased gluconeogenesis or other factors where uh, patients are coming off of medications and, and actually having truly lower um, blood sugars on, on, uh, on dialysis. And then uh, as in many populations, uh, there's a U-shaped relationship of hemoglobin A1C with mortality and cardiovascular mortality, um, suggesting that hyperglycemia may be detrimental and hypoglycemia may also be uh, detrimental. These are observational studies um, and, and we don't have intervention studies in this population. So before I get to our studies, now I'd like to try a couple polls. Um, and uh, I've, I don't know the answers. I'd really like to know the answers to these questions. First of all, um, for, and this is uh, focusing on dialysis, um, for dialysis patients you care for uh, who have diabetes, who manages their blood sugar? Um, and I'm, if you could all, uh, I think you can only do one answer. So if you answer for the majority of your patients, that would be great. Sarah, I'll let you determine when the, poll is, is done. Can we flash up the results? Yeah, we'll be able to. I'm going to give everyone about 10 more seconds. We have 70% voted so far. That's pretty good. All right. So, um, the majority is by other people, primary care providers or, or, or endocrinologists. Um, uh, that's good to know. Next, uh, next slide, poll number two. Most of my dialysis uh, patients with diabetes are treated with, and uh, this is a kind of a list of interventions from most intensive to, to less intensive. Can we flash that one out, Sarah? about 10 more seconds.
broad range, and this is pretty consistent, not surprising with what we've seen in preliminary data from Northwest Kidney Centers. There is uh, quite a range, um, notably here about half of patients treated with insulin. Of course, we have fewer options for what to treat people with um, uh, uh, once we get to, to dialysis. Last poll, if I can get there, there we go. Uh, for my dialysis patients with diabetes, glycemia is primarily monitored with hemoglobin A1C, alternative markers, self-monitoring of blood glucose, CGM, nothing or not applicable. And after this, I'll get into those methods. Oh, interesting. Um, this is not exactly as I anticipated. So hemoglobin A1C uh, is commonly used despite its pitfalls. I'm actually glad to see so many people, um, so many patients getting monitored with actual glucose, either finger sticks or CGM at 39%. That's, uh, um, that's impressive. All right. So um, I want to talk now about CGM technology. Uh, and this is rapidly advanced, as, as all of you know. Um, and uh, uh, these are really quite remarkable devices. And I'll start with this Medtronic N-Light sensor because it shows this flexible, thin uh, filament that goes into the subcutaneous space and, uh, and measures interstitial uh, blood glucose. This correlates well with blood glucose. There can be a lag uh, when blood glucose levels are changing quite quickly, uh, but generally they respond very, very quickly. This particular sensor, which is the one we used in candy, requires calibration. So you have to do a finger stick um, to give ground truth uh, twice a day. Newer models, such as the ones on the left here, are factory calibrated. The, they don't require calibration, which uh, um, uh, prevents uh, finger sticks. Uh, with the Dexcom G6 here, you can see uh, some equipment. This is the inserter that uh, has a little spring-loaded device to insert it uh, in, under the skin. This is the transmitter, which is the piece that you wear to transmit it, and that can be, uh, signals then can be um, transmitted to uh, equipment like readers and, and iPhones here. Uh, and this is the Abbott Freestyle Libre, which is so-called flash technology. Um, which uh, uh, is intermittently sensed. You only get blood glucose levels when you put this, this reader over it. And then this is actually um, uh, an implantable CGM device. It can stay in for 90 days. It's not used much in the US. It's used more in Europe. This little capsule is placed under the skin in the arm and then this reader is taped over it and then that can be communicated um, for, for people. The CGMs can be used in a number of modes. Um, uh, real time and this intermittently sensed or flash technology is obtained by patients and used by them so that they can monitor their glucose and change their exercise uh, diet or insulin as needed um, uh, in a feedback mechanism. Or it can be a professional. These are devices that are uh, put out by diabetes clinics for the most part and, and, um, and then interpreted by physicians um, uh, to, to advise general uh, changes in care to participants. And those can be either in an open uh, mode or blinded mode, which is what we've used for research. The patients can't see it while they're doing it. Um, these are covered by Medicare, um, some of these devices for people who use three or more insulin injections per day. And what's very exciting, of course, is, is that these can be linked to insulin delivery devices to make closed loop um, systems. There's a, a wide range of complexity of these, starting uh, at the most basic uh, with sensor augmented pumps. Uh, that's where uh, the glucose sensor um, uh, through an algorithm can sense when uh, glucose levels are getting critically low or the trends are getting low and it can shut off the pump, for example, to prevent overnight hypoglycemia um, by stopping the basal insulin overnight. Um, and there are progressively more uh, complex algorithms uh, which are lumped in this new term, automated insulin delivery systems, which are two closed loops where this control algorithm uh, can uh, um, do more advanced functions like change basal rates or even administer boluses for people who are increasing over time. And this is 
the so-called artificial pancreas. There's one of these approved in use right now and, and, and more coming. And while uh, the technology and approvals are coming, uh, there's a lot of do-it-yourself algorithms. So uh, people developed uh, um, non-FDA approved algorithms to take CGM data and, uh, and have insulin pumps controlled. Um, and these are widely used uh, and there's a, an effort to uh, standardize and, and regulate and, and approve these over time. Um, one important part that has gone with the development of all this technology in CGM is the um, ability to analyze that data and develop clinically meaningful metrics. So what's shown here is an um, ambulatory glucose profile or AGP uh, put out by Dexcom for its uh, D6. It shows uh, over an average of, of numerous days, you know, what, what are the mean glucose levels and the distribution by time of day. And, uh, and then important uh, codified standardized metrics like average glucose, the mean glucose of 169 here, um, what that would translate to uh, for an estimated hemoglobin A1C. And then these uh, percentages of time uh, in the target range, which is 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, uh, low, very low, high, very high, and uh, in coefficient of variation. And there are, are, are target um, therapeutic targets that can be used to guide clinical care. For example, trying to get your time and range to more than 70% or more than 50%, depending on how strict you want your control to be. Um, and these have been used for clinical trials to advance therapies as well. And I'll give you an example of that. So do these things work? Um, well, they do in terms of intermediate outcomes. There are a number of trials that have shown that in type 1 diabetes in particular, CGM can improve hemoglobin A1C without increasing hypoglycemia. Here's an example of one, the GOLD study, which was a crossover trial um, of, of CGM um, versus standard self-monitored blood glucose. And you can see um, uh, in the group that got CGM first, uh, while we're in the CGM, uh, hemoglobin A1C was decreased by about half a percent and um, then rose back up. And the group that got uh, CGM second, CGM was, was again reduced, or hemoglobin A1C was reduced by about half a percent. And um, it, these devices also reduce glycemic variability um, as defined by coefficient of variation. They uh, increase pa uh, patient reported satisfaction, a uh, very important outcome as well. And while this study wasn't uh, powered to show it, they, they reduce hypoglycemia even while getting the overall glucose down. There's some data also in type two diabetes. And this is a study from Nicole Earhart who uh, just last year moved to our division of endocrinology at, at UW. Um, this was a study of over one year of people with type two diabetes not taking prandial insulin. So, about a third were taking basal insulin, um, and then uh, two thirds were taking oral hypoglycemics. So more, more le less intensive and, and more common regimens in type two diabetes. And uh, half of the patients or participants received intermittent uh, real time CGM with feedback. Um, and then had, uh, um, that was through weeks 12, zero through 12, and then had standard care for 52 weeks compared to just standard care with self-monitored blood glucose the whole time. And that uh, uh, early CGM period resulted in a drop in hemoglobin A1C of about half percent, which was significant and was maintained uh, thereafter. And this was without a lot of changes in meds. Presumably this was mediated mainly by changes in, in behaviors. Um, and then this is an exciting trial published now about 18 months ago. Uh, uh, the first big trial I'm aware of, of automated insulin delivery system or, or, or the, um, the artificial pancreas. And so this was in type 1 diabetes, um, comparing a closed loop system, a fully automated system versus um, the sensor augmented pump that I described. Um, it was a six month trial and it used this time and range as a primary outcome variable um, uh, measured by CGM. And you can see that uh, compared to the sensor augmented pump, the more advanced closed loop system increased the time and range uh, by 11%. Um, and it actually decreased at the same time, the time below range, um, so reduced hypoglycemia. Uh, really exciting results. So what do we know about uh, 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 use of these devices in CKD, um, given the fact that it may augment uh, or, or modify some of these uh, effects? Well, we don't know a lot, to be honest. Most of these studies, of course, excluded or, or did not include uh, people with CKD. Um, 
We've done some work here. The CANDY study was a study uh, sponsored by the ADA that we did here that you've heard about uh, from, from other presenters over time. Um, it was uh, an observational study um, that took people with type 2 diabetes, CKD, and uh, use of in either insulin or sulfonylurea and uh, monitored them for two seven-day CGM uh, periods with the Medtronic device. Uh, its goals were to determine hypoglycemia incidence, risk factors, and sequelae, and look at markers of glycemia. Um, uh, we enrolled from UW, Harborview, the VA, and the Diabetes Care Clinic, had 81 people with CKD and 24 people uh, from the same uh, uh, sites uh, with normal uh, EGFR. Um, on average, diabetes duration was about 20 years. Most were using insulin. Uh, there's a wide spectrum of GFR, average 38 mils per minute. Hemoglobin A1C was 7.8% on average. And Aram Ahmad uh, and Zona Bataki were two endocrine fellows working at the KRI at this time. Earl Hirsch and Dossie Trentz were also involved in the study along with others. Uh, and we've published a number of these results. Um, we did find that hypoglycemia was common in these uh, participants. We had 255 episodes of sustained uh, glucose less than 70, 68 episodes with sustained uh, levels less than 54 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, on average, participants were getting five episodes a month or having half an hour a day in hypoglycemia, most commonly in the morning, shown here in the graph. None of this was reported by participants. It was presumably mostly asymptomatic. Um, uh, people with lower hemoglobin A1C tended to have hypoglycemia more often, but this was a poor uh, correlation. Uh, and surprisingly to us, um, these rates were not different than the control population. Uh, we don't know why exactly. My theory is that we overmatched. We matched the controls very carefully on demographics as well as duration of diabetes and medication use, and, and perhaps we just made them um, uh, look very much like CKD participants. Zona and Leela uh, published a paper looking at glycemic biomarkers and how they perform uh, in CKD using uh, these data and using the average glucose by uh, um, CGM as the gold standard. Um, uh, that glucose can be con converted into a glucose management indicator, which is really the estimated hemoglobin A1C um, using the CGM glucose and looked to see how hemoglobin A1C correlated uh, with, with uh, that gold standard uh, GMI by level of EGFR. So starting in the, I don't think I'm uh, showing my uh, cursor. Um, anyway, starting with the lower right of these graphs on the left, um, there was a, uh, except for one outlier, a pretty good correlation of hemoglobin A1C with blood glucose and with normal EGFR. That was uh, maintained in the EGFR 45 to 59 and 30 to 44 range. When we got to less than 30, you can see there's more scattered. There was no bias. Uh, the, the, the dots were neither systematically above or below the line of identity, uh, um, but there was more scatter, so less precision, precision in that range. And uh, this really supports uh, um, hemoglobin A1C as a, as a valid uh, indicator of average glycemia in CKD at least down to 30 and maybe down lower um, with uh, decreased performance below that, which is what the KDGO guidelines ended up um, uh, recommending uh, with these data supporting uh, that recommendation. And then on the right, what you can see here is the correlation of, of uh, alternate uh, biomarkers, glycated albumin and fructosamine with mean blood glucose. Um, and, and the take home here is that those other markers in this population did not perform any better than, than hemoglobin A1C. We'll skip the slide for time. Um, Nisha Bonsal and uh, Nazim Akum from cardiology also led a, a sub-study in CANDY, which used um, this uh, seek heart rate monitor um, placed at the same time as a CGM. So we could look at the temporal relationship of glycemia with subclinical arrhythmias in this group. And they published two papers. The first um, looked in the CKD type 2 pop, uh, diabetes population at rates of subclinical arrhythmias uh, summarized here. There were pretty high rates. These are rates per person year of subclinical AFib, conduction abnormalities, ventricular arrhythmias, and SVTs. And then uh, explored how that uh, related to, to glycemia. And the approach here was for each of these episodes, 
um, to look at the glycemia at the time of the episode and the 12 hours leading up to the episode and compare that to the same participant on other days when they didn't have um, an arrhythmic episode. So presumably uh, many other factors were similar. And what's interesting is at the time of the arrhythmia, uh, compared uh, to non-arrhythmia days, there's no difference uh, in glucose, but you can see there was a quite substantial difference in glucose uh, in the eight to 12 hours preceding the arrhythmia, making the hypothesis that maybe um, periods of relative hypoglycemia um, have myocardial effects that, uh, that uh, predispose to, uh, to arrhythmias further down the road. Uh, this is a really interesting application of two very detailed um, mechanisms of gathering data uh, together. Um, uh, it's hypothesis generating, hasn't been replicated yet to, to my knowledge. And then Laura Maeda did a nice uh, study too that she presented in a really nice grand rounds, I think a couple of years ago, looking at neuropathy, peripheral, peripheral neuropathy, which was uh, higher in CKD uh, than controls and also uh, um, worse in terms of symptoms uh, with people who had worse glycemic control on, on their CGM, suggesting that maybe this has implications for, for neuropathy. And I'm gonna take a second and go back to the patient that I presented in the very beginning um, who had um, uh, recurrent hypoglycemia despite his A1C of 9.1%. And, and he enrolled in candy. And uh, I don't know for sure, but I think he, that he's this dot on the graph that I showed you before with a A1C above 9%. Um, and interestingly, when he enrolled, his uh, estimated A1C was about 7.2%. So basically right where we want him to be. And it turned out that he's um, somehow an overglycator. So he's glycating more hemoglobin than you would expect for his actual uh, true blood glucose. And this was eye-opening to him and me and Jerry Palmer, who was his endocrinologist uh, at the time. And it turns out that the hemoglobin A1C had just been misleading and causing him to um, inappropriately intensify his regimen for many years. And, and Jerry, uh, for a while, started using fructosamine instead of hemoglobin A1C. The only time I've seen that switch uh, to be useful. Um, uh, uh, and then ultimately, uh, this patient now is on um, the Libra, uh, Abbott Libra uh, um, uh, intermittently sensitive, sensitive uh, CGM, which he said has completely changed his life that he's able to much better control his glucose and avoid these hypoglycemic symptoms. So in my last couple of minutes, um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, and talk about where we're going uh, next with this. And that's a new study called BLOSSOM, which stands for Blood Sugar Sensing on Maintenance Dialysis. We thought we learned a lot about uh, a glycemia in stage three and four CKD and uh, want to extend this approach uh, to dialysis patients where abnormalities and glycemia are likely to be uh, more uh, extensive and hemoglobin A1C has, has more problems. And so we're testing uh, in an observational sense, risk factors for hypoglycemia, risk factors for hyperglycemia, and then um, the clinical outcomes that may result from those. It's a classic uh, cohort study design based around a 10-day uh, period of continuous glucose monitoring at, at baseline, where we also include and collect data um, by uh, questionnaires and, and, and other uh, wearables, I'll show you. Uh, like with Candy, uh, we will return results um, uh, to each participant on an individual level uh, in, in the event that they find that useful. And then we'll follow them up over time, you, pr predominantly using electronic data uh, for, for outcomes. Um, we're looking for 600 people at C with, uh, um, uh, treated with dialysis. That's a third of Northwest Kidney Centers. And so we have very broad eligibility criteria. Basically, you have to have uh, be an adult uh, treated with any form of dialysis and speak uh, one of four languages into which we're uh, translating informed consent forms and, and other materials. We're technology heavy. Um, we're going to use the Dexcom G6 uh, for CGM monitoring. We're also using Fitbits to monitor at the same time um, physical activity and sleep, looking at heart rate variability using this monitor um, that Ben Lidgard is, is helping us advance um, uh, to look at our, our variability. And we're partnering with a local app company, Brooke, uh, to develop a, a way for patients to report symptoms um, that they do or, or don't have uh, associated with, with hypoglycemia. Um, we're taking a very broad approach to community engagement. 
Uh, we started before even applying for this application, which is funded by NIDDK. We've really made a, a streamlined protocol. We've just started the study. We started last month enrolling people, and we're, in addition to, to patients on dialysis, um, we're um, enrolling people as controls, particularly providers and staff who want to learn more about the technology. I think everybody in the division is, is welcome to do this. If you'd like to wear one of these devices, uh, see what it uh, looks like, how it feels, and what you learned for it from it, uh, contact me or, or, or Lisa Anderson, uh, and we can enroll you in the study as a, as a control subject. And we're going to roll out the study unit by unit and shift by shift. Uh, across uh, Northwest Kidney Center starting this month. So we hope to learn more about glycemia patterns in, in, in uh, dialysis patients, generate hypotheses for interventions, identifying patients who are at risk of low and high uh, blood glucose, develop uh, um, and try and identify compelling interventions um, and appropriate outcomes and sample size for, for trials and next phases. And we do hope that there may be uh, more uh, short-term clinically relevant uh, information coming out, including uh, asking the question whether patients on dialysis have glycemia profiles that merit real-time CGM, um, and if so, which patients would those be and, and, and how might we do that? We don't really know how to use this technology now in this population. So I went a little over, I apologize. But I've tried to say that uh, hypoglycemia is common and, and probably quite morbid in this uh, uh, population, people with diabetes, CKD, and kidney failure. Um, with CKD, there are unique risk factors and uh, a real need to improve glycemia ascertainment. Uh, CGM, I've just touched on, is really revolutionizing diabetes care um, and is a great research tool that we've been able to use here and also a good clinical resource uh, for, for some of our CKD patients, particularly those on intensive insulin regimen. So I've shown here uh, all of the, the Blossom team um, that's getting going on the new study. I look forward to telling you more about that as we, uh, as we roll it out. And uh, I'll thank others at the KRI um, research sponsors and, and all the participants we've had in the study so far. Thanks, Ian. Um, just in the interest of time, I think I'll go ahead and hand it over to Raj so you can do our next introduction. Um, but I'll just say, really exciting stuff, and I'm glad that our dialysis population is getting their own study.